I um, will partially apologize for the title. I've been uh, giving a, a talk like th similar to this uh, to folks who aren't quite so scientifically inclined, so I have to make it exciting so they start off on the uh, right page. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, our approach to host vac factor antivirals, and then also tell you uh, a, a case study, which is the fast center fatty acid synthase uh, enzyme and its application as an antiviral uh, target. So. Again, I'll give you a little bit of background about why we at 3V think a host factor antiviral is a good approach to drug making. So if you look at the current antivirals out there today, direct acting antivirals, typically they're gonna target a host protein, a host enzyme. Um, the good news is they're direct acting. You can see the clear relationship between the mechanism of action and the potency of the drug. Um, and you can get some very, I should say, potential exquisite specificity, i.e. you can target the viral protein without having an off-target effect on the host. Unfortunately, reality is that's not usually the case. Um, in the cons, uh, the specificity does limit the spectrum of viral pathogens that any particular drug can um, approach. And so if you are Tamiflu, for example, and you're really good at targeting the influenza neuraminidase, you're not so great at uh, targeting uh, anybody else's neuraminidase. And the emergence of drug resistance is a real uh, public health issue. Um, if you look at the influenza H3N2s that are circulating today, the seasonal strains, if you look at the 2009 H1N1 derivatives, they are resistant to the adamantane, sort of the uh, bread and butter of influenza drugs over the last uh, several decades. If you look at the H1N1 seasonal strains, those that existed bef just before the 2009 uh, pandemic strain uh, broke through, and the current H7N9 strain, they are resistant uh, to the neuraminidase inhibitors. So you can see this is sort of start, starting to set up that perfect, uh, or I should say imperfect storm, where you're getting the two classes of drugs, uh, widespread resistance within the viral population, and I will just say the likelihood is I don't think it's too far along before it starts to adapt uh, resistance to both classes, and then you're a little bit out uh, uh, out of luck. So many people, as, as we talk about our programs and we talk about looking at host factor antivirals, there's this, oh, you know, that seems a little frightening. Well, if you think about the world of antiviral drug development, there are already host factor antivirals out there. One of them is fact a host factor that hits other host factors, and that's interferon alpha for hepatitis C and also for certain indications in HBV. Uh, there's Maraviroc, which was, uh, is a drug that targets CCR5. Uh, and also uh, where, where the uh, GP120 protein binds uh, for HIV. And there's many others in development, just recently in PLOS uh, Pathogen, an HSP90 inhibitor for RSV uh, from Berkeley and UCSF was uh, described. So lots of people are thinking about this, and I actually think it's a great credit to the virology community uh, that we are approaching it from different perspectives. So it is what it is today. We've got these direct acting antivirals. How are we managing the current uh, therapies out there. Well, first of all, you have to worry about treating drug-resistant virus. How do you do that? First thing you can do is you can look for a drug that hits that same virus but a different mechanism of action. So if you think about the world of hepatitis C or HIV, if you've got a, uh, a nucleotide uh, analog and you become resistant, well, let's put in uh, for hep C an NS5A uh, inhibitor. And so you can approach it by using different mechanisms of action. The other way, and I'm not suggesting this is a great way to do it, is you can follow the antibacterial model. You can make a drug, wait for the bug to become resistant, make another iteration of that drug, repeat. Um, and essentially, if you look at the world of antibacterials in the last five decades, it's based off of four chemical scaffolds. So if you look at all the drugs out there on the market today, you can trace them back to the beta-lactams, the tetracyclines, the aminoglycosides, and the cephalosporins. And they're all derivatives of each other. So there's not a lot of innovation. There hasn't been a lot of pressure for innovation. And so I think one of the things that the antiviral community is trying to do is break out of that pattern and look for new ways of approaching these potentially uh, significant problems. We also need to limit the emergence of drug resistance. So you'll see what's been done for hep C and HIV, which I think to great credit to those communities, they're combining multiple antiviral drugs into one therapy, which helps manage the resistance. That said, that's a very difficult path to take. So you have to understand how each of these drugs behaves individually, then start to understand how they work in combination. It's not a trivial undertaking, but it also does seem to work. Uh, and the host factor antivirals. Yes, in the lab, you can find resistance in some studies, but overall, getting an interferon alpha resistant virus for hep C is virtually uh, impossible in the clinic. So 
what are we doing? We want to take a different approach. So our idea is let's look for broad spectrum antiviral activity. Someone comes into the ICU and they've got a severe respiratory infection. Um, if you think it's bacterial, you're going to give them a broad spectrum antibacterial. If you think it's flu or maybe it's RSV because it's somewhere in December, right now there's nothing specific you can give them or there's nothing general you can give them for those two together. So our idea is what if we had a respiratory virus drug? Doesn't have to be flu, doesn't have to be RSV, it could be both. And so that's one thing that we're trying to achieve is something that is a broader spectrum application so that you can get that patient on a therapy that's, that's benefiting them very, very quickly. It also gives you the potential to treat emergent pathogens. So uh, one of the talks this morning, I'm, I'm astounded by the number of viruses that are out there that are continuing to penetrate the human population. It takes somewhere on average of eight to 10 years to go from an idea or a first clinical trial to a registered antiviral drug. Well, that's a little bit too long sometimes if you've got a virus that's running rampant. So if you have a drug already available that's registered, that's gone through all those fancy hurdles, and now you've got an emergent pathogen, maybe you have a chance to very actively intervene. We also think the host factor antivirals have a high barrier to the de development of drug-resistant virus. So by using a host factor, the likelihood that we're going to get a drug-resistant virus clinically uh, is somewhat small. And so how are we going to go about doing this? We want these broad spectrum, high barrier to resistance. The way that we think about it is we want to find host pathways that have two aspects. One, a pathway that multiple viruses rely on, and two, that we think can be safely modulated. So there's a number of ways of doing that. Uh, there's a number of ways that 3V uses. Here's one sort of canonical way uh, that we've used, and this came from uh, one of our founders is Ari Helenius, who's at the ETH in uh, Zurich. And he and his lab really started to pioneer this idea that they could examine uh, viral replication cycles by inhibiting every cellular gene there was and then trying to understand which genes interact with the virus. So what we do is we can take an siRNA set and we'll, we'll already cull it down. We're not going to look at every human gene. We're not even going to look at all these, quote, druggable genes. We're going to look at genes that we think multiple viruses rely on. We're then going to also look at ones that we think can be modulated. So if it's a critical host factor, the likelihood is we won't even put it in our set. It's sort of uh, teaching the pig to sing, if you will. And then finally what we'll do is we'll combine those siRNA sets, those genetic elements, with compounds that match up. So the idea is we want to be able to get to a drug fairly quickly, or at least an initial hit. So we run these screens, we'll make an siRNA transfection plate, we'll throw some compounds that match them up on another plate, wait for whatever period of time we do, infect with the virus, and then uh, depending on the virus and the assay we have, we'll use uh, a high-end um, robotics and, and micros, microscopes to go find out which of these genes and its associated compound work together. So that gives us both a very quick screen to say we've got a genetic hit and we've got a chemical composition validation. Wow, we actually have something we want to move forward with. So that's how we think about approaching uh, targeting new viruses and, and new um, targets. So the one I'm going to spend most of the time on now is FASN, or the fatty acid synthase gene, and its application in virology. So before you all run back to Wikipedia, like I had to the first time I heard about this thing, um, I'll remind you what you learned from, from your Leninger or Stryer books, uh, which is FASN is a key enzyme in the fatty acid synthase pathway. So it's a large homodimer. It has six enzymatic domains in it. And what it does is it essentially takes uh, one a molecule of acetyl-CoA, seven of this two-carbon malonyl-CoA, and it just keeps building this thing up until it gets to a 16-carbon palmitate, palmitic acid, uh, fatty acid. It's the only enzyme in our bodies that makes palmitate. So that palmitate then goes on and does multiple things. For energy storage, it'll get put into diglycerides and triglycerides. Um, it will go on to be made into ceramides and other complex lipids. And then importantly, it will also go on to be post-translationally modify certain proteins. And for hepatitis C, one that we know is palmitylated is the NS4B protein. So I said we wanted, to under, we wanted to look for pathways that we thought multiple viruses would depend on. So off we go to PubMed, and sure enough, what we find out is that people have shown that dengue virus interacts with FASN, hepatitis C virus, and I'll go a little bit more in detail on this in a moment, interacts with FASN, and also what I'd call some very early evidence by either siRNA or some older uh, compounds in the literature that flu, CMV, and the Coxsackie virus interact with FASN. So that was criteria number one, hits multiple viruses. 
Secondly, why do we think we can safely modulate this thing? Really, the majority of the work comes from some knockout mice that have been made over the years. First of all, you cannot knock it out uh, from the whole genome. It is uh, embryonically lethal. However, there are adult liver-specific knockouts, endothelial cell knockouts, and cardiomyocyte knockouts, which in general look absolutely fine. They look just like their litter mates until you put them under some rather stressful conditions. So FASTN's fairly active in most livers of most animals. As I said, these liver knockout mice look just fine until you put them on a zero-fat diet. Not a low-fat, but a zero-fat diet, which after one of those cookies, I don't have to worry about for a while. So essentially, when you put these guys on a zero-fat diet, they become steatotic, they get all these fatty acid um, storage problems, and they uh, for sure uh, start to have some other pathologies associated with that. But on a normal diet, look perfectly normal. We also know that there have been other inhibitors, and one of them is called platensamycin, that have been given to mice at high doses for a month, and animals are perfectly fine. It was originally uh, designed as a metabolic drug, so these things uh, were actually quite safe and well tolerated. So from that, we said, okay, we got the multiple viruses, we've got evidence that we can modulate it, and I'm gonna spare you the MedChem uh, process for the last 18 months, and we made some compounds that we think are very specific for the human FASN, or for FASN of, of mammals, um, and uh, it's one we call TVB2640, and it's shown on this slide. So we can take a rat, we can administer it orally, uh, the compound, 2640 at different doses, then we'll wait for either 10 or 22 hours, and what we'll do is we'll give an IP injection of that rat, some C13 labeled acetate. What'll happen is that acetate will get converted to acetyl-CoA, acetyl to malonyl-CoA, and then integrated into palmit, palmitic acid. And so essentially, we can measure C13 palmitate in the livers of those animals. The red bar over here is the control group, um, much like this pointer. Um, so the red bars are the control groups, and what you can see is at 30 or 60 mg per kg, we can suppress that liver enzyme very effectively in those animals. This is an allosteric inhibitor. It is not covalently bound to the enzyme, so, and we actually think that's important. And sure enough, if you wait for 24 hours and do the same experiment, uh, we don't see such levels of suppression. So we get the drug on board, we suppress the enzyme, and we also relieve the pressure uh, on that enzyme at will. So we were very happy with the properties of that compound. So what about the virology? So from the literature, we knew several things. First, we knew that if you block FASN with an siRNA, HCV has a hard time entering these cells. The understory is likely because one of the co-receptors for HCV uh, is palmitylated, and you stop palmitylation, the receptor doesn't get to the surface, the H, uh, HCV, sorry, wrong virus, HCV uh, doesn't get in. Over here on the bottom right is RNA replication. That's where we spend a lot of our time at 3V looking at this virus, and what we know is that if you block uh, FASN, uh, you can block HCV RNA replication. More importantly, NS4B, one of the HCV proteins, has two specific palmitylation uh, uh, attachments on it. If you knock those out genetically, you knock out HCV RNA replication. So all that goes together quite nicely. And then finally, some, some work was published uh, about two years ago uh, for the core protein of, of HCV. And again, it's palmitylated. If you knock out the palmitylation site, you now are no longer able to package uh, the HCV RNA. So here we are with one drug, one target, hits the virus in multiple places. We actually think that makes it a very attractive antiviral. Here's the gratuitous antiviral slide. On the left is the G genotype 1B replicon for hepatitis C. You can see we get a nice suppression of the viral RNA with an IC50 uh, around 60 nanomolar. On the right is infectious hep C genotype 2A, and again, uh, the, the IC50 in this case is around 40 nanomolar. Shown on the table below, then, is our first evidence that we are actually hitting fast, and it's the hitting fast is what's giving us the antiviral response, because whether we isolate the protein and do this in vitro, whether we look at a HeLa cell that doesn't have any HCV RNA, or we do the HCV RNA or infectious virus, essentially, the potency of that compound is, a, is essentially identical in all those different scenarios. So hitting fast then equals an antiviral activity. We work with the replicons a lot, and for those of you who've worked in hep C, of course, the, the one thing you want to know is, are you just somehow messing up translation and the expression of luciferase? So that's what you see in the purple bars, is we get about a 95% plus inhibition of the luciferase by uh, 96 hours after drug treatment. If you look at NS5A staining on the bottom, you can see the protein actually starts to go away. And then if you look at the load of HCV RNA in those replicons over time, essentially we're able to clear it out. 
In red is telaprevir. It's a protease inhibitor for hep C, uh, licensed a couple of years ago. And what you see is after treating these replicons for six days, we essentially clear the hep C RNA out of those cells. If you use our inhibitor, the TVB2640, it takes about 10 days, but again, uh, we essentially clear the hep C RNA out of the cell in that time frame. So not only are we suppressing lucif uh, the luciferase signal, but we are indeed uh, uh, inhibiting protein expression as well as clearing the RNA out of the cell line. So we wanted to make sure that we really, one of the things about small molecule drug discovery is that you've got to be sure that what you're hitting is the enzyme you think. And so we wanted to do one last sort of validation experiment to say, yes, we are indeed uh, hitting FASTN, and that's the reason we have an antiviral response. So here's the way we designed the experiment. We took our replicon cells, and we essentially added palmitate back exogenously. So this is the product of FASTN. The idea is if we inhibit it, and we add back palmitate, can we relieve the antiviral response? So the first thing we wanted to know is, when we add palmitate back, do we still inhibit the enzyme? And the answer is yes. So this is just looking at C13 labeled palmitate in the presence of our inhibitor and different levels of palmitic acid in the soup. And sure enough, we inhibit the enzyme spot on whether we have zero or 50 micromolar palmitate added back. That same experiment that we then asked how much RNA replication is going on, and the bottom line is, as we added 25 or 50 micromolar palmitate back in, we relieved the antiviral response. And so the antiviral activity is being modulated through the inhibition of fast hen. So we're very happy with that. Now, one thing that we continue to think about is, well, 50 micromolar palmitate was able to, able to overcome this response. Gee, um, can I not just eat enough Cheetos and somehow uh, overcome my antiviral response? Well, obviously, we need to do this study, but that's probably several Big Macs worth of palmitate um, in our bloodstream. So it's an awful lot of palmitate for us to get rescue back. So as I said, we, one of the things, one of the hallmarks of having a broad-spectrum antiviral is that we can treat drug-resistant virus and we can treat other viruses. So the first thing, we're working in hep C, we said, do we hit other genotypes? So shown on the top right, we had genotype 1A, 1B, 2A replicons, and sure enough, we were able to uh, hit both of those with about the same potency. And then we made replicons that had mutations in them to each of the classic direct-acting antivirals, to Laprevir, uh, the nucleoside inhibitors, the NS4B and 5A inhibitors. And the bottom line is, if you look at the purple bar, that's our drug, and essentially our drug has nearly 100% activity regardless of the mutation. The one exception is the NS5A Y93H. We get about a 60% activity. We don't fully understand that yet. something that we're looking into. But the red bars are the control compounds. And what you would like to see is those up, if you don't have resistance, up near 100%. Well, you can see that the experiment worked because all these control compounds were indeed no longer able to control the replication of that replicon. So our drug was active regardless of the resistance that had already been uh, put into the replicon. So that's great. We treat it. We treat resistant viruses. Do we make resistant viruses? So here, again, uh, for the, for the non-Hep C aficionados in the audience, um, we take this replicon cell. This is telaprev. This is a control experiment. We expose it to the drug for a month. Um, we, look, we get colonies. We clone them out. Then we take the little purple replicons, the HCV RNAs out. We clone them. We sequence them. And in five of five clones, uh, we found an A156, either serine or threonine change, which is the canonical change for, for telaprevir resistance. So the bottom line is, when we expose replicons to telaprevir for a month, what we get is a very clear, very easily identifiable uh, genetic change that says, yes, you're telaprevir uh, resistant. We can put those back into normal cells and, yes, confer resistance. So we're not the first ones to do this. It's just simply saying this is how the system can work. So what about our drug, TVB2640, the FAST inhibitor? So we put the cells in the presence of this drug for a month, and sure enough, after a month, we get cells that are now resistant to 2640, and as a control, they remain sensitive to telaprevir as we would hope they would. So what's next? Well, we did just what we did last time. We took out those replicons from five or six independent clones. We sequenced them. It's an RNA virus, there are changes throughout, and there is not a single common change in any of those replicons. We looked specifically at the palmitylation site. We did the whole uh, RNA sequence, no, no common one, nothing in the palmitylation sites. There was no evidence here we had an HCV genetic change. So at this point we said, well, now what do we do? So one thing we can do is we can take those cells there that are 2640 resistant, and we can 
quote, cure them of their replicon. We can get that replicon out of there. So that's essentially what we did. You, you passage them in a different drug, you get the HCV replicon out, and now you have what's called a cured cell. And we wanted to know what does that cured cell look like. So we took a wild type replicon, one that we know is 2640 sensitive, telapivir sensitive, we put it back in that cured cell, and we got resistance again. So essentially the bottom line of this experiment is the HCV RNA does not have a resistance mutation, but these poor cells that we put under G418 and drug for the better part of six weeks do. Why is that? We still have to examine that. If you can, look, you can look in the literature, not for hep C, but for some other fatty acid inhibitors, and it's possible that these cells have turned on lipases. Um, I heard someone talk at the liver meeting a couple years ago, and his point was, Every tumor cell wants to be a liver cell, and these are, in fact, tumorigenic liver cells. They turn on everything because a liver cell's job is to clear your body of crud, um, and one way to do that is to turn on lipases, which allow you to bring palmitate in from your triglycerides and diglycerides, something we need to examine further um, but uh, have not gotten to yet. So we looked at the whole pathway. We said, okay, great, FASN does it. It should be true that other enzymes in the pathway do it, and it is. And it is. So we've used ACC1 inhibitors. They block HCV replication. Others have done serine palmitol transferase, which is downstream of palmitate. Yep, it does it. And SCD1, which is a desaturase that makes palmitate into a 16-1 or 18-1 or uh, fatty acid. Yep, it inhibits HCV. When we saw that last one, we said, well, gosh, maybe it's just that last step that's important. So what we did is we blocked the fast end, we added back the product of that SCD1, which is a 16-1 uh, fatty acid, and sure enough, it stays blocked. So not only do we need the 16-1, we need the palmitate, and I'm pretty sure we also need those post-translational modifications. So again, one drug hits this virus in multiple places. So that's great, that's HCV, isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is. Um, but we want to remember the premise was we have a broad spectrum antiviral drug. So recently, uh, through our uh, friends at Metamune, we were able to get an RSV that had a GFP protein put into it, and we've started to ask the question, is there a potential that FASN inhibits RSV? And the answer is yes, it does. Shown on the top panel in A549 cells is RSV GFP with no drug. At 24 hours, 48, 72, 96, and you can see that nice bright green fluorescence over the cell monolayer, that virus has taken over, and the cells are, are starting to uh, be less than happy. On the bottom panel are those same cells, A549s, with our drug. And what you can see is by 96 hours, yes, there's, there's green cells there, probably the input from the infection, but we're not seeing the massive viral spread. Recently, we've done it in HEP2 cells, which is a very uh, productive substrate for RSV. Sure enough, top right, you can see without drug, a lot of green fluorescence in those cells. On the bottom, nothing. So why is that? We don't know yet. Something we're looking into. Uh, the F protein does have one polymethylation site in it. It's down past the transmembrane pro, uh, domain. Is it important? We don't know. We've not genetically knocked it out, nor has anyone else that we've talked to yet. So that's a potential. It's also possible that there's other either polymethylated proteins or fatty acid derivatives this virus needs. We heard this morning, hep C, very lipid associated. RSV, maybe not so much, but clearly membrane-bound virus probably uses membranes uh, all over the place. So we're now in the middle of getting to the mechanism of action evaluations. What is it about fast inhibition that inhibits RSV? We want to get into some uh, in vivo animal models with these drugs. And then obviously now that I have what I call a real virus, uh, no offense to the HCV virologists in the audience, uh, we can do some of the studies looking for resistance both in animal models as well as in vitro. So we think with FASN, we've shown we can modulate hep C and RSV. Um, we're looking at others where there's a pretty strong hypothesis for FASN, C, uh, CMV, dengue, and a few others. Um, we know we've got a high barrier to resistance in the HCV model. We want to extend that into a fully lytic virus like RSV. And our drug is pharmacologically active, and it's well tolerated. We've put these in the animals now for the better part of a month or so, and uh, we're getting very good uh, tolerability and very easily uh, administered by oral dosing. So what are we going to do with all this? That's a great question. Um, hep C uh, 
if you look at various parts of the world, uh, Hep C, the, the major peak of disease, sequela of Hep C in the US and the EU is coming in about another 10 to 15 years. Um, the people who are infected now, who were infected 10 years ago, are gonna develop the hepatocellular carcinomas, the fibrosis, the cirrhosis uh, during that time frame. If you look at China and India, their disease consequences will be there now and in the future. So there are still uh, high, higher transmission rates than you have in the US. RSV is a major pathogen in pediatrics, in the elderly, in people with COPD and other underlying conditions, and bone marrow transplant recipients, where RSV still has a very high case mortality rate. And it gives us the ex opportunity to explore uh, either biothreat or emerging pathogens with the possibility that if we develop this drug, we might have something available should the next SARS, the next H7N9, the next whatever it is happens to be uh, that happens to rely on FASN. Uh, for one of its major pathways. So I too did very little of this except throw some emails around. Um, Yamani, who's back in the audience today, did a lot of the RSV and FASN work as long as the hep C work. Uh, Greg uh, Duke also worked on this and then Hong Jin at Metamune, who's in the audience, I wanna thank for helping us get through the paperwork of Metamune and 3V to get us these viruses in, in, uh, in our hands so that we can do this uh, important work. So thank you very much. Permutation <laughs> site, you know, have you tested the flu, you know, whether this drug work? So should. it's a great question. I, I think your beautiful work in Dr. Lamb's lab said that they, it is unlikely it would have worked. We've tried. Flu doesn't seem to be impacted by this drug. It grows just fine. Yeah, the, the other thing is I'm still concerned about safety, you know, whether yeah. a human would be safe or not. It would be nice to find out, you know. It would be great to find. We're, we're actually expecting to, to put our IND for this compound into cancer patients this summer uh, or this fall, and, and so we'll get some ideas to that. The one thing I'll say is I know people get very weirded out by the idea we're attacking a host factor, and, and after 10 years of statin therapy and hopefully 10 to 20 more for me, um, we do it all the time. But uh, you're right. I mean, it, it needs to be proven. Yep. So since you're inhibiting a post-trans, can you, is this on? No. Yeah. Okay. There since you you're inhibiting a, sorry, a post-translational modification, the, the virus, uh, I guess, is not assembling and going on for multiple rounds of um, replication. But what's happening to the protein in the cell? And is it, is it better presented as antigen to the immune system? It's a great drug? question. So unfortunately with hep C, we have, don't have the animal models. With RSV now in hand, those are some of the questions we want to ask. But right now with hep C, there's, there's not a model system that we, there's a humanized mouse with a human liver and we just, we tried once and it was a mess. So um, we haven't done those studies yet. Yeah, uh, have you ever tried any non-amyloid virus on the drug? <laughs> uh, we have not. Um, it's on the list to do. Um, and there's one in the literature that has a weak association. Um, and and, and uh, we'll see. But uh, we have not done it yet. HRV 16. <laughs> that was a very nice talk. I enjoyed that. Um, very interesting target. So in your, your HCV cells, that was a very powerful piece of evidence when you cured yep. the cells and showed that the cells were resistant. If you just do the converse and take the RNA out of the replicon, you show that that's still sensitive? Yeah, we're doing that right now. Um, I'll, the, the naked truth is we did it once and the replicons didn't replicate. We got them in and they just stopped dead, so we've got to go back and do it again. But yeah, I agree, we need to sort of wrap that up, yeah. I have a question. Uh, one interpretation uh, of your results could be that palmitate by some mechanism, enhances the fidelity of the hmm. polymerase, the RNA-dependent antipolymerase. Yep. Have you checked that? We have not directly checked that yet. I, again, I think with RSV in our hands, we'll probably something that we're a little more facile to do. But yeah, it's a great. It's, that's actually a great question.